Next talk will be about programmation or logic. Uh, sorry for my terrible French. I never learned <laughs> French. Uh, yeah, from uh, Lars Kupel. Um, yeah, Lars is a uh, consultant at Inok in Munich. Enjoy his it's talk. It's called InnoQ. <laughs> InnoQ. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Our uh, marketing department is very insistent that it should be called InnoQ. <laughs> Uh, bonjour, uh, bienvenue à uh, votre conférence. Uh, this is my extent of French. Uh, the talk title is uh, Programmation en Logique because rumor has it that this is what Prolog stands for. Um, I'm not sure if this is actually true, but uh, some papers say that this is the idea behind the name. And uh, yeah, I, I, I only speak very little French. Um, so if you want a live translation to French, you should ask Eric. Who speaks French? <laughs> yeah, um, I gave this talk first in uh, Copenhagen a while ago, and apparently they have a coffee brand uh, that is called Prolo. But obviously, this is not this talk is not going to be about coffee, even though we are at a programming conference. Um, it is going to be about the programming language. Now, I have structured the talk into a few parts, and to get you into the spirit of Prolo, I have given the structure as a Prolo program. So this is the this is the idea, and I will hopefully at, hopefully by the end of the talk you will be able to fully understand uh, this prologue program. And as usual, I will start with a joke. And as you can already see here, this joke is supposed to be funny, and the person sign is um, a comment. So this is a comment that should be executed by the audience. <laughs> so let's start. Um, of course, we can ask the question: Who has invented prologue? So this is a weird programming language, many people have heard of it, but nobody really knows where it comes from. And this is actually the first paragraph of the paper which has initially introduced Prolo. And um, it says, the role is everything that is the case. The role is the totality of facts, not of things. And the role is determined by the facts, and by these being all the facts. Now you may ask, who wrote these very intelligent lines? Somebody is nodding here. And that was Ludwig Wittgenstein. So Ludwig Wittgenstein single-handedly in 1918 has invented Prolog, even though the programming hasn't even been invented yet. So that was a joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was funny, but you laugh, so that's good. <laughs> now for real, uh, who invented Prolog? Um, it appeared in the early 70s in France, and the original developers are, could you please do me the favor of pronouncing them? Alain colmer Auer and Philippe Roussel. Okay, I have been pronouncing apparently Alain wrong before, <laughs> and this is this is Alain. I have no, I, I didn't find a picture of uh, Philip. And um, what's most important about Perl is that it used the .pl extension before Perl. Right? So Perl got it wrong. If you open a file in your editor and it highlights it as Perl, the editor is wrong. It should be edited, uh, highlighted in Perl. And uh, I'm not sure. I should have just used .pearl or something like that. And um, it uses a radically different programming paradigm. Now, I'm one of these weird people who have seen Prolog before they have seen uh, functional programming. So my, my view of functional programming initially was shaped by I have seen logic programming. Um, and, but it also works in any other, other way you, you will look at it. And I guess many here in the audience have seen imperative programming before functional programming, right? So if you look at functional programming coming from an imperative background, you see this shifting in, in attitudes and like shifting the way you think about programs. And Perl can do that too, right? So even if you already know functional programming, um, a Perl will be able to alter your view of programming. Okay, so brief primer. What is a Perl program? Well, it's a sequence of rules, or as mathematicians like to call them, clauses. Rules can have arguments. You have seen that already in the introductory slide with the uh, structure of the talk. Um, then these rules can also have conditions, obviously, otherwise it would be very boring if you couldn't even have any kind of conditions there. Programs can be queried, so that's sort of like SQL, and it's kind of perfect that the SQL talk was right before my talk. Um, instead of, instead of um, running, instead of computing expressions, so to speak, in Prolog you would rather create a program and then get some answer or a sequence of answers. 
Okay, so this is the reference to Wittgenstein again. Anything that is not in the program is not true. So program kind of has a closed scope assumption. So if you have, if you query a fact that's not present in the database, the answer is going to be false. It's not, it's not known, so it's not true. Also, queries may alter the program. Um, so this sounds really, this, when you first hear about this, it sounds really strange because like self-modifying code, do we really still want to do this? But then again, also in SQL, you can also alter your data. Um, and you can also alter like stored procedures. But of course, everyone who does that uses it with caution. So you wouldn't routinely alter your logic in your Prolog program. You would sometimes alter the data. You would write some, you would append some data to your fact base, for example. You would, wouldn't necessarily go and uh, change, completely change the way some computation data. And yeah, this is just like in SQL where you can use insert and, and update and stuff like that. Um, okay, so this is all very abstract. Now let's look at some concrete prolog code. This is the simplest possible prolog program. So if people tell you Haskell is so much better than Java because the hell world is so much smaller. Well, by that argument, prolog is much better than Haskell because the hello world is even smaller than that. So it's literally just that program that contains hi. And because it's a fact, just end it with a full stop. Because we're being polite, we use, we use uh, a symbol, so we just end this like a sentence. If you now open the, up the interpreter, you can ask if high is there, if it's a fact, and the prolog interpreter will say true. It is a fact. Of course, it's not a proper hello world program yet, because we haven't seen the world there. So we can just define a clause that takes an argument. So we have a hello clause that takes world as an argument, and then we can create the interpreter in the same way. We can ask hello world, and that's true. And what we can also do is we can also try to query something that is not true, or that's not known to the program, and then it would just say false, right? So we, we, we would go ahead and try to find this fact, and the fact is nowhere to be seen, but it must be false, right? Um, it used to be the case that people would say yes or no for 100% total compatibility, uh, and people who have problems would know that, that you will not get a reason, you will just get yes or no. At some point, uh, a few years ago, SWR Prolog has changed it to true or false. I still mourn that decision. <laughs> Another thing that you can do is, you can query with a variable. So everything that's uppercase in Prolog is a variable, everything that's lowercase is kind of a literal, and then you can query well, give me all the values of x such that hello x holds. And now this sounds a little bit like a programming language where you can do some, something like proofs to some extent. And then probably would try to find an instantiation of this x. And then, well, if x is instantiated with world, then hello world holds, and that's it. Right. So this is this convention that you have to keep in mind. Everything that's um, uppercase is variables, everything else is lowercase, and that's not Completely surprising, Haskell, for example, also does that sometimes. Um, for example, the type variables in Haskell are lowercase and type literals are not uppercase. So it's not completely, it's not completely a strange idea to use uh, capitalization for that. Okay, so let's look at a small program uh, because this was really just a tiny program. We want to make something more, uh, um, something more complicated. Now, by law, I would be required to show you family relationships. <laughs> Everyone who introduces Prolog uses family relationships. Um, but as of like civil disobedience, Perel, and I will be using locations instead. Uh, but it's really the same thing, right? <laughs> it's some hierarchy of things. Okay. So here's some facts. Um, I start with that Munich is in Germany because I'm from uh, Munich and there's also a lot of people from Munich at this conference, so yay. Um, also, there's someone from Augsburg here, I think, <laughs> yes. So Augsburg is the second most beautiful city in Bavaria. Um, and as you <laughs> you're out. Um, and then we can also declare for example that Germany is part of Europe. So you have this kind of hierarchical thing uh, where you declare that some small location is part of a large location. And um, you also have the location that um, London is part of the United Kingdom, and then the United Kingdom is part of Europe. <laughs> Geographically, exactly. This is not a Brexit joke, because unless the British Islands will just 
sail into the ocean, they will stay in Europe. Of course, reality is a little bit more complicated, but let's put that aside for a moment. Um, well, this is a very small program, and we want to, to, to figure out what, what kind of queries we... Well, this is not a program, it's just a sequence of facts. Uh, what kind of programs can we write this with? Um, well, we can write a program that will figure out if two locations are neighboring. And what does that say? Well, we have an x variable and a y variable. So we want to figure out if x and y are neighboring. And then we say, well, they are neighboring if they are in a common location, z. And as you might see, is that z is never declared anywhere. It's just a variable that I pull out of thin air. And uh, for the mathematicians here, it is existentially, it is implicitly existentially quantified. For the non-mathematicians here, it's, it will just try to figure out z that makes this true. <laughs> Okay, so when we would ask, for example, the query that, um, well, let's say, uh, neighboring Munich and Augsburg, then the solution would be that we would instantiate Z with Germany. And then if we use Germany, then you will have Munich and Germany, Augsburg and Germany, that means Munich and Augsburg are neighboring according to this program. However, if we would ask Munich and London if they're neighboring, there's no way to make this true because there's no such set that makes them into the same location. And we can actually look at that so that, uh, that you can see that I'm not lying to you. So let's look at uh, this. So this location. So this is this um, program. It's just uh, the same program from the, from the slide. So let's load this. Now this is of course uh, quite simple. We can also use variables here. We could, for example, say, "Give me all the neighbors of Munich," and then, according to this definition, Munich is a neighbor of itself, so that's fine. And as you can see, this program is not quite finished yet, right? So there's something waiting for an input. And if you want to, uh, if a prolog program can have multiple answers. Uh, sorry, a query can have multiple answers. And if you want to see the next answer, you obviously have to type semicolon. Because <laughs> semicolon is or in prolog. So if you put in a semicolon, it means give me more. And then the second answer would be Augsburg. Right. So that's cool. Right. And here, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that this comma here then means conjunction. So it means these two things have to be satisfied. Okay, another another fun program. Uh, we can also try to exploit the hierarchy here. And we could, for example, say, well, currently, according to this program, Munich is not in Europe. We have the fact that Munich is in Germany and Germany is in Europe, but we don't have the conclusion that Munich is part of Europe. But we can do that. Um, we can do a recursive query, so to speak. And we first say, well, we have this is in rule here, and it takes two arguments. And of course, if Munich is in Germany, then trivially, Munich is recursively also in Germany, so that's trivial. And then if we put a second line with the same rule here, then it just also means or. Like, if the first one doesn't match, you can just try the second one. And then we say, well, if there is a z, such as x is in z, and then z is in y, then also recursively, x is in y. Now, um, for people who are familiar with pattern matching, this looks a bit strange, because I have two patterns identical here, like I have xy and xy here, and those patterns should overlap. Well, Prolog doesn't really care because it will try all the patterns. It will just go through the file, and if one pattern matches, then it tries to continue there, and then for, can, it can just backtrack and then try another one. This is how you can make multiple answers. Right, so let's try this. We'll try Munich is in Europe. And that's true. And here you also see that this is some backtracking waiting to happen, right? So it could backtrack. 
Of course, if you have true an answer, backtracking wouldn't necessarily do any, give you any new answer. But if, you put, if you press semicolon here, it would say false. And this now reads true or false, and the logician would just simplify that to true. So that's fine. But I can also just press full stop, and it would stop backtracking. And again, I can ask if Munich, uh, what places Munich is in, and then I get Germany, Europe, and then nothing else. Right. Um, and the question is, how is this internally implemented? And before I will go to an in-depth explanation, I just want to show you that the SWI engine, which is this one here, has a debugger built in. So I can say um, trace. And then I can ask for what's going on here. Now, an underscore also starts a variable. And by default, SWI will always give you fresh variable names for variables that I use in my program. And then I can just trace through this and ask, well, is Munich somewhere? And we will find, yes, Munich. I don't know why it's called Creek. I have no idea. It's, it's not actually that creepy. <laughs> so Munich is in Germany. OK, so that will be an answer. And if I ask for the next answer, it will redo something. Right? It will try the next thing. I can just step through this and we'll eventually come to Europe. And if you see there's like one more recursion step happening. And if I try this again, redo stuff, and then we'll not find any more facts. So it will just fail until you get back to fault. Now I told you that I told you that the prolog interpreter can also change the program. So I could also add more facts. Debug mode, so I could also say assert and say location Berlin is in Germany, and then I could use Berlin as an example. So I could ask what what if anything is in Germany, and I would get Munich, Augsburg, and Berlin. And of course, I do have to make the Brexit joke, so I can also retract <laughs> location um, United Kingdom <laughs> Europe. And then that's not going to be a fact anymore. Can you please ask it about the Brexit date? <laughs> um, I'm, I fear that it would just answer false. <laughs> <laughs> the question is how to interpret that. <laughs> right. Okay, so you've seen some basic operations of the Prolog program. Uh, we can have rules, we can have conditions, we can have variables, and we can have um, assert and retract. Now, the question is, what's up with the syntax, right? So why is the syntax so weird? Why is like the comma the conjunction, why is it not like the empress and like why is it not like all the other languages? Um, so what, what, what's up with that? Like, who, why did you end up with this? Um, who here knows Erlang? Right. So you might wonder, is the syntax actually stolen from Erlang? Right. So what happened was that um, this guy, the Erl one of the Erlang guys, he used Erlang to build a time machine and to send the syntax back in time to the prolog guy. Now, of course, it was obviously the other way around. Um, this is actually from the three Erlang creators, use of prolog for developing new programs. It's called it's the title of a paper. And the way Erlang was designed initially was that they basically just build an embedded domain-specific language in Prolog. So they wanted to take Prolog and then add some concurrency features on top. So they just basically took the Prolog interpreter and then just added some more features until it, it made do or until it did what it uh, what it should do or what they wanted it to do. Um, of course, Prolog being a language that is able to backtrack. You can imagine it doesn't really play well with concurrency at all. So it was rapidly modified and rewritten. I mean, for proof of concept, it kind of worked. But um, for an actual language implementation, uh, not really. Um, yeah, and, but, but the syntax of Roland is still inspired by Prolog, even though the semantics is completely different. OK, so let's talk about some of Prolog's cool features now. And I specifically narrowed it down to cool features, not to any features, because Prolog also has some not so cool features. And uh, the most important feature is, of course, the backtrack. This is what makes Prolog um, this special programming language. Now, imagine 
you're in Japan, you're hiking in Japan, and you want to reach enlightenment. Now, in order to reach enlightenment, you have to ascend these stairs. This is not a scala job. You have to ascend these <laughs> stairs, but you can only uh, you can only uh, ascend these stairs if you answer the riddle posed by the first Chiba dog. And the first Chiba dog says, you are allowed to pass if you can tell me who among us is the best boy. And uh, the riddle is given conveniently in prologue form. So the best boy is an individual dog X, which is good. So we can already optimize it away because of course all dogs are good, so this is a no. Then the, the best boy will have to have dark brown fur and needs to be behind another individual dog Y that has light brown fur. So we can we can do that in prologue, of course. We can just run this prologue program and figure out who the best boy is, and we're going to do that now. So we start. We start looking at the first dog and figure out does the dog satisfy this condition that uh, it has dark brown color. And no, it's light brown. So we just pick the next one. Is that dark brown? Not really, it's black. But now we found the dog that is dark brown. So that's cool. Now we need to figure out if the dog before why has light brown color. And unfortunately, that is not the case. So if we check this, we will find this is violated. So we have to, we can't use that as an answer. We have to backtrack, right? So we do that. And if prologue backtracks, it basically goes back to the last point where it made a decision that can be altered. Now here, the last point where we made a decision that can be altered was the X, because we can't change the Y. The, the Y is specified to be before the X. There's no other choice there. But we could have picked another dog for the X. So this is what we do. We just go a little further and then we instantiate with a uh, little dog. Now this is X, dark brown color. We look at the Y, dog before, and uh, this dog actually has light brown color. So finally we have found the best boy. We have, we are allowed to uh, pass the stairs and we can reach enlightenment. Okay, so this is all nice, but what does it buy us? Like, why is this backtracking so useful? Or, yeah, why, why, why would we like to have that? Well, in traditional functional programming, we are talking about programming with functions. This is why it's called functional programming, of course. Um, and this is basically the abstract mathematical notation of a function. We have a function f, and it takes some input i and gives an output o. Well, this is a little bit too restrictive. We don't want that. We want something more uh, powerful. And this is what's called a relation. And a relation basically looks a little bit like a function, but instead of taking just the input, it also takes the output as an input, and then returns if it is part of the relation or not part of the relation. Now, this is, may sound super confusing, but basically the idea is a function, if you give it an argument, it will always produce exactly one result. With a relation, you can have a fun you can take one input and you can take produce no output, or you can produce an arbitrary amount of outputs. So it basically um, generalizes the notion of a function to some extent. So what does it mean in practice? Um, this is a uh, function signature from Scala, which hopefully you should all be able to read. It's not that complicated. Um, it is a function that is supposed to append two lists. So that's pretty standard. We take an access and y's, and then we return mm -hmm. those. Now, if you compile that with the Scala compiler, you will get exactly that also in the JVM. And you can call this function if you produce an access and a y's. There's no way for you to call this function with some undefined x or y. I mean, you could pass null, but let's ignore null for now. Um, you, in particular, you can't ask the JVM if I give you one input and the output, could you compute the other input for me? JVM can't do that. But with prologue backtracking, we can do that. And the same signature in prologue uh, looks like this. So we have a uh, rule that takes three arguments, list one, list two, and list one and list two. So this is 
The last one is obviously the, the result, the concatenated list. And the question is now, what does the question mark mean? And the question mark means that you can provide this as an argument, but you don't have to. You can also leave it unspecified. And then Prolog will try to come up with a solution for this. And um, this is best if I show it again, because uh, it's really a long explanation, but the, the, the code speaks for itself. Right, so this would be the traditional way of operating. You specify both input lists and you get an X back. And of course the resulting list will be four, contain four elements. But you can also do this. You can also say, well, if I want one, two, three, four as a result and I only know the first input, what is the X, the second input list that I should give you in order to uh, um, arrive at this list? And as you can see, Prolog has correctly deduced that this is going to be 3, 4. Now, if you know even less than that, you can also do that. Maybe you're in deadline, you don't really know how to write your program, it's just like, Prolog, please give me the inputs so that I can get to the output. And then, of course, it's not unique anymore. So Prolog will be able to cycle through all the possible solutions here. And then we get five possible solutions in order to satisfy the spirit. And um, in, 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 in particular, you can leave any combination of arguments off if the signature has these, has these question marks. Right? So you could do this. It's no problem. And maybe a little bit more explanation. Um, Prolog will not always give you concrete instantiations. It may also sometimes give you these um, a little bit more abstract uh, instantiations. So here, in the first one, you see that uh, y needs to be empty and then x is equal to z. So it doesn't know what x and z mean, concretely need to be, but it, it just they have to be equal and then it's going to be fine. And then the further down the line we go, you see that it starts instantiating um, longer and longer lists. So the pipe symbol means head and tail. So here the, we have like something, uh, a list that contains the first argument, variable 2, 7, 9, 4, and then a rest x. And you see that these um, these variable names they are repeated, and the further we go, the longer these lists are going to get, and this we, we can just continue to all infinity, right? So, at some point uh, we have to stop. And it's also possible to ask Prolog to give you all instantiations for a query. Of course, not for that one because there's infinitely many, but um, this one, for example, we could try to figure out all the possible instantiations. Right, so what you have to do is, unfortunately, Prolog doesn't really have a bound variable discipline, so sometimes working with bounded pre variables is a little bit strange. But what we have to, what we say here, well, we have x and y are the variables we need to satisfy. Then we give the query that has x and y undefined. And then the result list is rest, and you can see rest then contains all the possible instantiations to satisfy the query. So this Prolog is not only had querying capabilities, but also like something for meta querying capabilities. Of course, if you use final, you have to be really careful because there's no, like, Prolog has no type system or anything that guarantees you that the result set is, like, finite or something. So you have to be really careful when using these kinds of things. Okay. Of course, this, this has limits. So let's consider this updated function that not just concatenates two lists, but concatenates lists of lists. Um, I probably should have renamed it smoosh, but you know, you get the idea. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the um, prolog uh, signature for this, you see that there's now a plus here and not a question mark. And the reason is that if we take a resulting list, like one, two, three, and now we want to compute what input list could have produced this output list, there's now infinitely many possibilities. And the input list could also be infinitely long because we can have arbitrarily many empty lists interspersed. Now the plus means that Prolog at least wants to know how many lists this list contains. So it at least asks for you to give a length of the input list. So it needs kind of like a spine. Um, and here's what that would look like. Right, 
So I'm telling Prolog, please give me x, y, and z such that they those three concatenated give one to three, and then I can cycle through this. And there's a lot of solutions here. <coughs> now, if I wouldn't do this, if I would just say, well, give me any kind of combination, then I would say insufficiently instantiated, because there could be like arbitrarily many uh, empty lists in there. It doesn't really know what to do. And there's more than the passing question mark. There's this list from the um, SWIA documentation, and you have stuff like uh, argument must be ground, i.e. the argument may not contain a variable anywhere, so plus plus means something really concrete. Um, right. And there's all sorts of these things, and it looks a little bit cryptic, but you can just look it up, it's not a big deal. All right. Um, I've already tried to hint at it. This is not a silver bullet. For, for basically, you would expect that a conjunction using the comma doesn't care about the or, right? If you have an if statement and say if p and q, you don't usually care if it's p and q or q and p to give the same result. Now, unfortunately, in Prolog, that's not necessarily the case. If you have a query that says, well, member x123 does, so x must be one of these items, and then y must be two, and then x must be greater than y, so you are looking for the member of this list that is greater than y. Uh, greater than two, sorry. And of course, there's only one of them. So you have x can be instantiated with three, and then you have three is larger than two. Well, that's fine. If you reshuffle these clauses, uh, these these, uh, these subclauses there, for example, if you would check x greater than y first, you will get an error. SWR probe is not going to like this. And the reason why doesn't it like it is the order of evaluation is still left to right. So here we start with instantiating the x with one of these three possibilities. And then we instantiate y and then we do the check. Here we would start doing the check but we have no idea what x and y could be, could possibly be. Um, and arithmetic operations in Prolog need to be fully instantiated. There's Prolog, if you say give me any x and y such that x is greater than y and Prolog doesn't even know what kind of type it is. Like floating point number, an integer, who knows? Fortunately enough, if you find yourself in, in, in need of having to structure the problem in such a way, you can use the so-called CLP library, it's constrained logic programming, and FD means finite domain, so you only have finitely many possibilities. Then you can use just some slightly differently looking operators. So you have x hash greater than y, and x in instead of member, right? And what happens here is that, I mean, the very basic explanation, there's a lot more going on about it, is that Prolog will try to defer evaluation. It's kind of like lazily evaluated. It will try to collect all the constraints first, then run some speci specific constraints, constraints holding algorithm. It doesn't do backtracking there. It will run some specific algorithm and then give you the answer. The other advantage of this is also that it's much more efficient because these constraints uh, solving algorithm, they can do some internal optimizations. Backtracking can be very expensive um, and these can be very, very much more efficient. Um, and they can be used for real problems like the Einstein puzzle. I'm not sure who has seen that. This is a very common question in interviews. Right. So if you ever find yourself looking for a new job and then your interviewer asks you, here's this puzzle, there are five houses and the English person lives in the right house. I don't know why, but the English person just lives in the right house. Um, the Swedish person owns a dog. Uh, like, you know, it's like 15 constraints. And then usually they ask you to solve it by hand, but you can make a much better impression by saying, no problem, I'll implement it in Prolog. And it's actually possible to translate these rules pretty much directly. Uh, to Prolog. I'm not going to run the program, I'm just going to uh, show you the code. So, let's, uh, let's So, you see these hash operators there, so these are the CLP and D library, and then you can just basically give all of these, translate all of this pretty much directly. So you say, well, nationalities can be one number from one to five, colors as well, and then, yeah, the British person, lives in the Red House, which person owns the dog, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, I just Googled for this and found this immediately on Stack Overflow. It's, it's, really no, it's really no big deal. 
Okay. Um, one more thing. Prolog also has some very good support for parsing grammars. Now this is something that was really hot in the 70s and 80s for natural language processing. And this is a description of an English grammar, or basically some very stripped down version of the English grammar. So you have a sentence, the dog ate the bone, and well, S means it's a sentence, and then you have a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and then you hear this is an article, and then you have a noun and a verb and so on. Now this was invented by this guy, not sure who knows him. So this is Noam Chomsky, a political activist who has also dabbled in formal languages. <laughs> and he basically described uh, a way to, or he has defined a way to describe these languages. Uh, and you can also translate it pretty much directly into Prolog. So this is what is this thing would look like in Prolog. Um, and you see the comma and the period syntax is still the same, but instead of using uh, the colon minus, you would use these arrow syntax and then there's some transformation that's going on there. I don't have enough time to show this in action, but basically backtracking and, uh, and yeah, backtracking by direction computing also applies there. So you could potentially also generate sentences from the grammar. And in fact, um, Prolog was designed for parsing, right? So it was a born of a project aimed not at producing programming language, but at processing natural language, in this case, French. Now, I'm not entirely sure how amenable French is for being parsed grammatically, but they tried to do that. Unfortunately, they, it didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> I mean, the natural language is complex, and of course I'm joking about French, but any other natural language is complex, of course. And just as in your regular programming language like Scala or Haskell, you don't just uh, get to write these raw rules. Um, in Scala, you basically define a parser or in Haskell also it takes a string and then gives you back a list of parse results. And in Prolog it sort of looks the same, it's a predicate that takes some input string and some output string and gives you back a parse result. And then in Scala you use monad syntax to make it a bit better and then in Prolog you use this DCG syntax that I've showed you. This is the def definite clause grammar I think it's called. So you can't just write these raw grammars but you can also manipulate in a much more convenient way. Anyway, so this is the last feature. Uh, so we are at the end of the talk. Um, you are now able to instantiate question. So this is all these question. And if I can answer it, it's fine. But if I can't answer the question, we have to backtrack to the beginning of the talk. <laughs> so you better only ask the question that I can actually answer. I think I'm also supposed to say that we sponsored this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the talk. And uh, yeah, please uh, ask questions. Yeah, a very small question. So you said we can existentially find a common parent between two things, right? You know, yeah. And a neighbor example. Is there, what's the way to say I want both of them to have the, the same parents all the time? All the parents should be the same, like for all, instead of if there exist. If you want to use for all, then you would have to use find all. You would have to explicitly make it explicit, um, and then you have to cope with all the disadvantages of that. But uh, in, in principle, the backtracking only takes care of existential quantifiers. Uh, if you want universal, then do find all. Uh, so I've learned about Prolog at university, and I've been thinking about using it a few times, but what all of this like, uh, strikes me is that you basically writing a database in a text file and then you can create the database. Is there like a better way how this is handled in bigger projects in Baroque or? Okay, so I guess the question is about project structure. Uh, like more like because it's a, it's like a bad, da uh, bad database to write all your database data into a text file. Oh right, so the question is about can we handle data a bit better than just dumping it into a text file. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, Prolog is kind of a real word, mature program language, so they have like package management and everything. And also what you would usually do is you would split up stuff into multiple uh, multiple modules, so you would usually have your program in one module and then your database in another module. And if you want to be even more fancy, you can just load your database from any kind of external source, right? So you can have your data in a CSV file and then parse it and then using a sort, define it in your, like add it as a clause to your program. But you can also use the SQL, so like there's SQL binding for everything. So just in any other programming language, you can source your database from literally anywhere. The question is always, do you want it to participate in backtracking or not? Um, but you can just use the sort 
to like you, you load your data from somewhere and use a cert and then you have it part of backtrack right? as, as simple as that. Is it, is, it, is it good to like map the, or is it easy to map the Turo way of storing data into SQL or something? Yeah, it's 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 really the same thing. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the uh, the example from the locations, you basically define a relation. You have like two columns with the small location, the big location, and then it, it maps basically very simply to um, a table. Uh, of course, in Trollo you can also have stuff like lists in predicate, so that's going to be a little more um, work to do. But um, I guess Postgres also has like arrays or something like that, so like, I, I guess it should be quite simple to map. Uh, I would we all go out a limb and say it is a better match than object oriented members of what I see in our call. Right? There's actually implementations of Paul on top of relational database systems that are called data law. Yes. That's, that's a subset, subset yes. of Paul, and yeah. the fact it base is the contents of your tables. Yes, and I see the closure people have like a product out of that, the atomic. <laughs> Someone is near. <laughs> yes. You can use that as a database. Yes. Uh, if I want to use Prolog as like the language, is there good support for input output? And so, what's the story for side effects, and what's the story for normal functions? Right. So the question is about how to deal with input output. Um, I, I guess it's similar like any other language. So you could do it naively, and then you will just you can like write something to standard out, write something to standard in, and then you will have problems if you have like backtracking, for example, <laughs> because then you would ask again, write again. So what you would usually do is you, you have sort of like brackets. You can say something like execute this predicate on those, some context, and if it fails, then don't backtrack, just print error message or something like that. So you have like combinators that help you to deal with um, backtracking as a side effect, essentially. But you have no I.O. monitor or anything like that. So you, you basically have to be a little bit more disciplined, and then you have to basically, well, just like in other languages, you should probably confine your input output to some predicates in some file and not do input output all over the place. Um, but yeah, I mean, people have written web frameworks in it. Um, you can totally run a web application in Prolog. You can do it, no problem. Um, but yeah, you have to be a little bit more disciplined because you have to, you don't just have like exceptions as a side effect, but also backtrack. And then you have to use some special combinators that allow you to limit the effect of that. More questions? More questions? Thanks. Thanks.